My name is Ron Carrico. I'm with the San Diego Air and Space Museum and we're here today on the 29th of August 19, or no, 2012 uh, with Carl Silber who is going to give us a little oral history of something he's been interested in since he was a little child. His father uh, was a World War II pilot and uh, well, he'll tell the story right now. So, so Mr. Silber, why don't you say your, say your name and give us your address and phone number if you would. I'm Carl H. Silber, Jr. I live at 8865 Spectrum Center Boulevard, apartment 9203, San Diego, California, 92123. And your, uh, your father was a World War II pilot, is that correct? That's correct. What kind of airplanes did he fly? P-39 Air Cobra. What, do you know what year he went into the service? Yes, I do. Right after graduating from the University of Missouri, he was an ROTC cadet throughout uh, his college years, and he was commissioned a second lieutenant uh, in the U.S. Army at that time. And what year was that? 1937. Oh, really? So when the war actually started, he was on active duty at that time? Uh, um, actually, he was in a reserve officer, and uh, he uh, received orders to go on active duty uh, six months before Pearl Harbor attack. So he was, yes, on active duty when Pearl Harbor uh, took place. Where was he stationed at that time? Uh, he was at Mitchell Field, New York. Uh, that was the one of the, I think, the largest uh, Army Air Corps field on the eastern coast. Uh, they had uh, predominantly aircraft from all the different uh, uh, types and it was a jumping off place for flying to both the European theater and the Asiatic theater. So so when he when the war actually started then he was at, at the field you just said and then how did he get, do you, do you happen to know how he got to the Easter, the, uh, the Pacific theater? Yes I do. Um, I've Through my research uh, I was able to to actually find the historian's record for the 8th Fighter Group. And um, it, it's very interesting to read because uh, the historian was, uh, uh, you, you felt like you were living right with him during uh, the day-to-day -day events. Uh, they departed Garbutt Field on two Army troop trains on 18 uh, February 1942 and it took them four days to get across the United States to San Francisco and they bivouacked at Angel Island. Okay, so let me stop you right there. He actually left what, Mitchell Field to go to the San Francisco. Correct. He went by train, okay. And then he took, then from there, you know approximately when it was that he... Um, they bivouacked there. They wouldn't let them go into San Francisco. Uh, they well, he was a fighter pilot after you all. Yeah, they, they, for security reasons, they didn't want anybody to know that they were heading out. So they departed uh, Angel Island on a troop uh, ship escorted by a destroyer for a 30-day zigzag voyage all the way to Australia. Right. So what date was that that he um, got there approximately? That was... Um, the around the 23rd of uh, February. And so where did he, where did he land in Australia? Brisbane. Okay, and then what did he do next? Uh, they offloaded there. They offloaded their aircraft. They had taken the wings and the tails off for the trip, and they spent the first uh, 30 days reassembling their aircraft and started flying uh, missions out of Brisbane Airport. And what, the, what kind of missions were they flying? Or uh, they, they were just flying air co cover. There really were no uh, enemy action going on at that time that far south in uh, Queensland. So that takes us up to early 42, Correct. April, May. Um, I re don't recall when it was we actually went to Guadalcanal, but it was fairly early after that, wasn't it? Yeah. Shortly after they got uh, their aircraft uh, back in the air due to the, 
the fact that the war was actually taking place in North Queensland and Northern Australia. They were moved from Brisbane up to Garbett Field in Townsville. And their timing couldn't have been worse. They arrived in Townsville on their very first Japanese bombing day. So that was their baptism into the war. So now Townsville is, is in that chain of islands that comes down past Guadalcanal and that island in that area somewhere? Yeah, it's about 800 miles north of Brisbane, uh, right in the middle of Queensland, North Queensland. Did they, uh, did they actually fly there? It's an awful long way for a fighter. Yeah, yeah, wow. they did. And uh, uh, the history is that some of them got lost. They didn't have any uh, maps uh, to navigate. Uh, they were using road maps, so visual, visual flight uh, conditions. And if the weather became uh, inclement, which it did frequently and does to this day along that coast, uh, they had no, no way of navigating. And quite, a, I think there were over 15 of them that were lost on that on that trip due to not knowing where they were and running out of fuel and crashing somewhere. Wow. So he was uh, he was a captain at the time or was he promoted about that time? Uh, at the time he left the United States he was still a lieutenant and within nine months he was a captain. Do, do you have any evidence of what kind of missions he actually flew when he was at, up in that area? Um, yeah, they uh, immediately started flying, responding to Australian Coast Watchers reports. Uh, the Japanese were flying over from New Guinea preparing to invade uh, Queensland, Australia. Right. And uh, they had prepared, uh, they were sending submarines into Townsville, mapping the area, planning their invasion down there. Now, at, at this time, you were how old? I was three. So you don't remember your father at all, I guess. Uh, I have a few memories, and I don't know if they're really memories or just from pictures that I've mm -hmm. seen of him. So now he, I see here that his, there's a, a, an aircraft record that shows that he was on this B-24 that crashed. Uh, do you know how he happened to be on that B-24 that day? Yes, I do. Um, his group, the 8th Fighter Group, flew out of Garbett Field in Townsville for three months and then they were shipped over to New Guinea uh, in September of 1942 to a, a, a little southeast coastal airstrip that they cut out of the jungle called Millen Bay and they started flying bombing missions and escort missions for the B-24s that were coming over to bomb the Japanese uh, who were trying to get across the Stanley Mountains into into uh, the south part of Papua New Guinea. Hmm. So the the um, oh, and now what was the name of his his uh, his unit? I mean, it was the Eighth Fighter Group. Was there a squadron attached to that? Um, yes, I have a picture of, uh, in the other room of his squadron and uh, they uh, uh, after he was there for approximately four months uh, he had been overseas for a total of nine months and they were starting to get uh, give them R&R &R back to Australia uh, plus they were all getting sick with malaria they ran out of uh, food and rations. Uh, they were relying on what uh, the natives were able to scavenge for them. So he and uh, one of his best friends, Captain Keipel, went back to Australia to Townsville and they had two week R&R &R there. And uh, after that was complete, they went uh, to Garbett Field and started hitching a ride back to their to their base in New Guinea and that's how they happened to catch a ride on the Texas Terror 
which was flying north their way, and uh, they and seven other passengers uh, boarded the aircraft, and um, it took off um, on uh, 18 December, um, and disappeared for two years. No, nobody knew what, what, where it went or what happened to it. It was just declared missing. Now, is this this hinge? Is, so, it, well, first of all. The aircraft he was flying on was a B-24D, That's correct. Built here in San Diego. Okay, and and I see there's a there's a crew list of the people on board, but with all uh, due respect to them, what we're interested in is your, your father at this point. So, it says here that, I'm looking at the individual aircraft record, it says that it took off local time 18 December 1942, and then it said the re wreckage and, and remains were found, reported, and recovered sometime before November 1st, 1943, so a year and a half later. Any idea how they have actually found the aircraft wreckage? There's two versions of that. There's the Army official version that you're looking at, and there's the Australian local people's version. Um, the Army claims that the aircraft impacted on Mount Strelok, which is correct, and that all were killed on impact. Um, the Australians claim that the aircraft did crash on Mount Strelok, and for 10 days after the crash, uh, during the day they would see uh, flashes of light like somebody was signaling. Uh, and at night they would see fire up there from a bonfire. So the Australians believed that three or four of the guys survived and were trying to signal uh, somebody on the mainland to, to come help them out. How big is this island? Um, it's a huge island. It's uh, 35 miles uh, from north to south and 15 miles wide same size as Oahu, Hawaii, and still to this day is uninhabited. Now, but somebody had to see things there, to, so it had to be inhabited by somebody. Who was there? Uh, the, again, the Army version differs from the local version. The Army claims that Aborigines who were mining for tin in the stream bed that runs by below the crash site uh, stumbled on the wreckage. The Australians tell me that Aborigines were like your American Indians. They were not miners, they were foragers. They, they didn't believe that Aborigines were mining for tin. And their version is that shortly, well they say two years after the crash, that down in a little town on the mainland called Lucinda, uh, three Aborigines came in one night and uh, proceeded to get uh, drunk. And they started uh, uh, fighting. Some fight broke out between them. And one of the Aborigines pulled out an American 45 pistol from his pocket. And when the bartender saw that, he called the constable, and uh, the constable came in and took them into the local Lucinda jail. And in the course of interrogation, he found not only a 45 pistol, he found American dollars, he found uh, American army watches, uh, and uh, he says they finally admitted that they had stumbled on an American aircraft and had taken these items um, at that time. So there's two complete versions that differ completely on this fact. Well, are those the people who reported seeing the fires and the lights at night? Uh, some of them, yeah. Uh -huh. And um, the uh, uh, the Australians also told me that uh, they, and, and this was told to me by one of the, 
the Australian guides that took up the first group of three American Army guys that went over to identify the aircraft, that they found three remains down in the creek bed, and that uh, one of them had a broken, broken leg. And they felt that these three guys had survived and were trying to get down the ravine to the beach. And the man who found my dad's dog tags, uh, he found them at the top of the mountain, 300 feet above the crash site. And uh, it leads me to think that he, my dad survived and had climbed up there and he was the one who was signaling at night building fires and during the day with uh, some type of a mirror to uh, uh, get attention. Wow. Hold on one second, please. information. I would not know it if I hadn't gone over there. What a story. They can make a movie out of it. Yeah. Why did you guys come in here? That's amazing. You need to get, you need, yeah. Well, you could make a total movie out of that. You talk to the Aussies like I did, and um, I'm sure they're going to tell the truth. Got they have no hide. reason. To yeah, they've got nothing to hide. Those are their parents. Tell stories. Yeah. I think that's still the there. army version. It's always going to be different. I think was written for the public, the, the relatives, to sure. make it sound like, uh, you know. Well, there were there were crashed aircraft all over the place. This was a very common oh, story. Right. I mean, they, you know, every time they launched the mission, they would lose ten percent. That was almost acceptable, maybe less than that. But so anyway, the. Uh, so it says that on November 1st, 1943, so this was some of the Army people that went to investigate That's and this, this report. And I gave you uh, a copy of uh, uh, a subsequent Army visit that was made in 1957 when, uh, uh, after a very fierce storm on Mount Stralock, uh, some additional remains uh, were uh, uncovered and the Army sent another crew to recover those remains. Do you, do you have any idea how far this island was from the place they took off from? Um, yes, I do. Flying time, 15 minutes. Um, it, it, At 150, that's not very far. Not very far, and uh, the again, the local natives, Australians, told me that they felt that uh, the aircraft was obviously in a, in lost in the clouds in a, in a severe storm. They also had reported mechanical trouble, and um, so obviously they couldn't see where they were going. And the Australians said they heard that aircraft circling overhead for what seemed like hours, apparently trying to find a, a, a hole in the clouds to come down. So now when you say Australians, you mean the Aborigines that were there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Aborigines were on the island, heard the aircraft circling. I mean, I'm not sure how you would even get that sort of information out of it. <laughs> Aborigines myself. But it says that Mount Stralock is 3,000 feet high and wing section, which indicates the general area of impact is some 600 feet from the peak in the cliff face. Um, you would think mm -hmm. that they would be wouldn't be flying that low if they didn't have some problem. So there had to be some sort well, of problem. From Again, I go back to what the Australians told me. They figured out the amount of fuel on board and the time that the plane uh, uh, crashed that probably they were running low on fuel and had to come down and try to find a break in the clouds to land some, somewhere. They knew they were in the general right area of Garbutt Field, but obviously didn't know exactly where they were. Well, it says they departed at 8.15 local time on December the 18th. Aircraft crash in Mount Straylock, Hinchbrook Island, some same date at approximately 0905. The time was indicated by a damaged watch found in the wreckage. Okay, so in other uh, words, it uh, was airborne for less than an hour. Again, that's the Army version. The local natives over there tell me that that aircraft didn't crash until later in the day 
in the actually in the evening, and uh, they uh, had one gentleman uh, actually uh, swore that uh, this version is not correct uh, as to the timeline. Was that from the nineteen forty three? bar fight scenario or sometime later? Um, well, that that's reports that I would received when I made my first trip over there. So, okay, let's go to your trip now. When did you go there? Um, when I was stationed at Yokota Air Base in Japan. When was that? 1992, which was uh, the 50th anniversary of Fifth Air Force that started in 1942 in Australia. The local base newspaper, the Fuji Flyer, started running weekly articles about their early history down in Australia and New Guinea. And I knew my dad was down there, so I followed those articles very closely. And one day I just went over to Fifth Air Force headquarters to the uh, Fifth Air Force uh, historic office and told him my interest and um, he gave me five addresses to write to as a surviving relative to get information on my dad. I did and it took anywhere from one, two, and three years to get replies. Um, finally, uh, in 1997, I received a copy of that crash report that you're looking at from the U.S. Army. And did you have any idea where he had crashed before that? No, before that, I did not know, my mother did not know, my grandmother, relatives. So you didn't know whether he was killed in combat or anything? It's just We knew nothing other than he went missing. How did you get to Innsbruck Island? Um, I was in Hawaii at the time, and um, I flew on a Korean Airlines flight to Cairns, Australia, and caught a bus down to Lucinda, and I hired a local tour guide, Bill Pierce, to take me out to the island. I contacted the park ranger uh, who's in charge of giving authority to visit the island, it's a, a park, national park in Australia, and only accessible to people who get his approval to go over there. I told him my interest, and um, he gave me approval to go over there. So Bill took me over there at 5 o'clock in the morning, one misty, rainy morning in at the what, dark. What date? And his flat bottom boat. What date? Uh, that was in. July 1997. Okay. And now, so the so the the oh, the island is not that far away from. Well, it took us an hour to get out there, you know, on this uh, uh, small flat bottom boat okay. with an outboard motor. And then what did you do when you got there? Pardon? What did you do when you got there? Uh, I was shocked. Bill was in short pants, no shoes. Uh, he pulled into the mangrove swamp, jumped down into the mud, and proceeded to sink up to his, his knees in the mud around there. And he tied the boat up, and uh, he gave me his hand to help me jump off. And I had short pants, but I had a pair of tennis shoes on. And we had to slosh through 50 yards of muck and mud uh, into the creek bed uh, that would be my avenue to descend uh, uh, or ascend up to the up to the crash site. How far was the crash site from the coast? Uh, took me five hours. And was the guide with you? No, unfortunately. He had a group of English tourists that he was escorting that day, so he drew me a hand held map and pencil and he said Carl it's going to take you five hours to get up there and it'll take you longer to get back so I'll be back here at this point at five o'clock in the afternoon 
and to pick you up. And he said, if you're not here, you're going to have to spend the night here. So I had a real incentive to get up there and get back down, because <laughs> I, I, there's no way I was going to spend the night on that island, uh, uninhabited, uh, um, in all that muck and jungle. So you got there about 6.30, 7 o'clock yeah. in the morning and started walking? Yeah, about noon. And, uh, and that's, we said, that would be winter time down there, right? Pardon? It would be the winter time down there, but still probably hot. Yeah, that's actually, they're, they're, summer, it's the hottest time of the year. Their oh, climate's right, 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 right. reverse from ours. And I had a backpack, I took water, a sandwich, uh, an orange camera and um, a VCR camera with me and um, I started climbing rock hopping uh, and the water was very high because it had rained three days before I arrived uh, I kept slipping because the rocks were full of uh, moss and I'd take two steps forward and <coughs> one step back uh, a couple times I slipped and actually f submerged, fell right into the. So the, the, the airplane crashed near, near a stream, is that right? No, but it leads you up to uh, within uh, about uh, 30 yards of rock climbing to where it is. Uh, I made the mistake. Uh, I, I just couldn't keep going in the creek bed. It was too too difficult. So I tried to to navigate uh, on the edge of the creek bed and I found out very quickly that was impossible. Uh, they have these jungle vines that uh, uh, just blow in the breeze and they have thorns on them about that long and uh, very quickly I got tangled up in those. I still have a scar <laughs> here uh, uh, where I was trying to push him out of the way, and uh, so you got up to the site about about noon. About noon, okay. And uh, I how long did uh, you spend there? Pardon? How long were you there? Less than thirty minutes. Okay, now you 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 have familiarity with aircraft. Yes. Okay. Was was it enough for you to kind of visualize in your oh, mind yeah. what had happened? Yes. Um, you can see where the left wing tip three feet in first clip the mountain. You can actually see the, it's on one of those videos, I, you can see the damage uh, on the left wing and that completely pulled the left wing off of the aircraft and so the rest of the aircraft uh, just slid down the, the mountain from there. It's a 75 degree angle at that point. So it was like a sheer face almost. Yeah, it, pretty much so. And um, uh, Well that probably would help them survive because the airplane was probably spinning like crazy and maybe, dissipating energy. However, in talking to um, Patty Jameson, who was the first guide, he said that the um, jungle actually uh, cushion the uh, fuselage from just immediately disintegrating on the on the ground. Are the engines still up there? Yeah, the whole plane's still there. And how about the nose? What was the nose like? The what? The nose section. Um, it's dove into the ground. Uh, you would have to dig down to it. and uh, uh, But the tail is there intact both wings, the fuselage, a lot of it, there's still live 50 caliber machine gun shells all over the ground, broken glass, uh, instruments uh, uh, from flying in with the CAF and the Collins Foundation and their B-24s uh, are able to recognize uh, the radio uh, and uh, the uh, some of the other uh, instruments that uh, are in the cockpit of the aircraft, uh, but uh, it, uh, you can still see the green color and the stars and bars on, on the aircraft. 
the tires look like brand new Goodyear tires you can read that um, and um, so the, the site hasn't been tremendously picked over then it sounds um, like. people don't know about it no. and the park ranger told me that prior to my arrival only seven people had climbed up there um, most of them were military people who knew about and had a reason to go up to identify it uh, or to go up and pay their respects. So. Were there, do you think there were any, when this report from whenever it was done, was there any remains left at that time? Um, it says I, have, I think so. Yeah, it says the records remains were finally reported and recovered sometimes before November 1st, 43, so there may have been some remains. I think so. Um, Barry Atkinson, who took the Army guys up on their second climb, said that uh, the lieutenant and two sergeants had uh, folding backpacks that were wood boxes inside of a backpack, and he said uh, what they were able to collect went in those three little backpacks from 12 men. So that tells you something. There wasn't much to, to find. Of course, it was uh, the men had laid there on the ground probably for over two, two years before the plane was located and another year after that before the another climb went up to recover remains because the first climb they, they just went up to identify the tail number and destroy the Norden bomb site. And Patty Jameson told me that he was a little shocked when the lieutenant pulled out a 45 and fired it right into the bomb site. He thought that something a little more technical would have been done, but that's that did the job. So um, is the bomb site still there? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because yeah, that would be in the nose of the airplane. In the nose of the airplane. So you actually got up to the nose of the airplane. Well, there's the nose of the B-24 is actually like two stories. Oh, right, high, right, right, you know. sure. So, um, uh, so you don't remember seeing the, the bomb site then? No, I don't. Yeah. Were the seats no. still in the airplane? Pardon? Were the seats still in the cockpit? Seats still in the airplane? I, I didn't see that. No. But you do I have. I tell you the honest truth. I was looking at my watch, deciding when I had to head back down. Isn't that the way it is when you get to something like that, and it's all and of a sudden you run out of time? I, I but you do have some. You do have some items with you that yes. belong to your father's. Why don't you show us what they are? Yes, I brought um, uh, some things to uh, to show you, and uh, uh, this is his captain's bars that were given to me. Okay. And um, I have. His dog tags. So now, where did you get the dog tags? From an Australian. Oh, wait, a I got them on. You got them on? I was afraid to lose them, so I oh. put them on. An Australian gave them to me, and uh, he didn't want to tell me where he found them. So, uh, so now when you say Australian, are you talking about uh, Aborigine type people or? No, re Australians. And he found them? He found those at the top of Mount Strela. Well, if that will focus, I don't know. Huh. I wonder why there's a little nick in the end. Are they, were they made like that all the time? Yeah. I don't remember ever seeing that before. Um, they use that in case of uh, uh, of a, a, a killed fallen soldier. Uh, they would take one of the tags with them to report, and, right. the, and the other tag they would put in between the teeth, right. and that notch was to hold it from slipping out. Oh, hmm. I've never seen that before. I thought they put it on their toe. Actually, this gives an address that's kind of interesting. That's it says, my mom's address in St. Louis. Yeah. At that time, they gave a lot of information they don't give now. So tell me, how, what was your, as you're climbing up the mountains, besides being tired, what was your feelings when you actually arrived on the scene? Well, 
you can imagine. Um, and it was the only thing I had heard all day long was the sound of birds in the trees and uh, they had told me that there were poisonous snakes up there uh, that you have to be careful uh, and uh, so I was constantly looking for any of those guys and uh, uh, I, I, I just sat down for a few minutes said a prayer to my dad and uh, uh, told him I was sorry I couldn't spend more time and then I I headed back down. It took me over five hours to get down because uh, you have to just slide on your rear end right, right. on these rocks and hope that where you land you won't twist or break or sprain an ankle. So yeah. no, but I thought I thought I heard you say, or I read somewhere. I read a little bit about this last week, that you thought the dog tags were found at the top of the hill. Correct. So he must have been in a, a, a good enough condition to t climb to the top of the hill. Well, how did they get there? I don't know. But uh, but of course, these many years later, there's no evidence of you know. But somebody, so it was an Australian army officer or Australian ranger or what kind of Australian person was it that gave you the tags? Uh, he was a local resident of uh, Ingham. And, What's uh, Ingham? Uh, that's a uh, coastal town that the ceremony uh, on the video that I showed earlier this morning took place. Um, and uh, he... Uh, he walked up after they had a, uh, a dinner to close what they called the Texas Terror Week ceremony that took place. And he walked up to me and he grabbed my hand and put something in my hand and closed my hand and he immediately took off. So I'm standing there like this and uh, I saw he was heading out of the hotel, it was in the Lee's Hotel, so I made a beeline right to grab him, and I caught up with him in the kitchen, and I said, uh, where'd you find these? And he said, I, I don't want to tell you, because it, 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 it'll make you feel worse. And I said, well, I'm sorry, you're not going to leave here unless you tell me. I blocked his exit from the kitchen, and he finally said, okay, I'll tell you where I found them. And uh, unfortunately, the man, uh, when I got back from Australia, uh, about a month later, uh, he passed away. He had terminal cancer, and he hung himself. Uh, uh, it's it, it just amazing. If I hadn't been there, I wouldn't have these today. So, okay, so how old was the fellow? At the time of the crash? Well, now how old? Okay, for, first of all, what year was this when you received the tags? Uh, this was on the 60th anniversary, um, 2002. Okay, so how old was he at that time? In 2002, how old was he? Who? The fellow who gave you the tags. Oh, the man that gave the, he was in his 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he would have been a young man at the time. Correct. When he found them, could have been. But did he say when he found them or anything about the finding of the tags? He just said he climbed up to the crash site and he decided to go on up to the peak of the mountain and have a look around and go down the other side uh, of the mountain. And uh, while he was up there, uh, that's when he found... Uh, these captain bars and my dad's tags. So. Anything else around at all? That's no, all he told he you? he didn't report anything else. I had a hard time holding him. He, he was he was very nervous. He wanted he just wanted to get out of there. But obviously he wanted me to have these. So you probably don't even didn't get his name, I guess, even. Um, I did, and I have it in my records at home, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I didn't bring that today. It would be interesting to find out more about him than who his relations were and so forth and so on. I'll 
get that information to you. When I well, get wow, that's really, really interesting. So when you're up at the top of the site, could you see out very far from where the crash site was? I mean, could you look out and see the ocean? Not the really. Way? It's so heavy jungle. Okay. Uh, no, you, you can't. You'd have to go up to the top of the mountain to get any view. Yeah. From the position where you were, I mean, did, and you sat down and you said a prayer, did you actually just sit there and kind of reflect on it a minute, what it must have been like? Just a short while. Mm -hmm. I got myself back down to uh, the bottom um, and um, luckily I had taken my tennis shoes off that I wore through the, the mangrove mud and I had washed them out in the creek bed and I left them on a rock uh, to dry. And I think I was a little groggy, extremely tired. I know I was bleeding. Uh, I was walking down through the creek bed and I walked right over my tennis shoes and if I hadn't placed them there, I would have missed that spot where to go back in and meet uh, Bill hmm. Pierce. So, I think we're, uh, about, we're about out of time here, I think. So. so I put my tennis shoes on, went out to the spot he said to meet him at, and I sat there for maybe 20 minutes waiting for him, and all of a sudden I realized I hadn't drank or eaten anything Jeez. all day, and uh, I still had no appetite, so I just I ate uh, an orange, and here came his boat putting in with a bunch of English tourists. Uh, I have a picture they took of me up and uh, on the table in the other room. I look pretty, pretty, uh, pretty sad. Well, listen, I think we're just about. I think we're out of time. Um, listen, that was a very, very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Well, thank you for listening and interest. I appreciate that. And I'm sure your uh, ladies here will be were interested in the story too. <laughs> Turn this thing off. Um, big, 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 big. No, that's not. Carl, that's a really.